Good morning or good afternoon to everyone, depending on where you're joining us from. We still have a few people logging in, so we're going to give them a minute or two to get settled and then we'll get underway. Okay, I think we're ready to go. Thank you all for joining us today to celebrate the completion of the largest fundraising campaign for nature in Canadian history, NCC's landmark campaign. You made the campaign a success. My name is Sarah Hoida and I'm the National Media Relations Manager at the Nature Conservancy of Canada and I'll be your moderator for today. I'd like to start by stating that we at the Nature Conservancy of Canada respectfully acknowledge that the work we do across the country is on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities past and present. For a millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I would like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. The Nature Conservancy of Canada is a national charity and Canada's leading not-for-profit private land conservation organization working to protect our most important natural areas and the species they sustain. Since 1962, NCC and its partners have helped to protect 14 million hectares, that's 35 million acres from coast to coast to coast. We'll be joined today by three of our NCC speakers. Dan Kraus, our senior conservation biologist, Esme Batten, Program Director for Midwestern Ontario, and Delaney Schlemko, Natural Area Manager for Northeast Alberta. Before we begin the webinar, however, I'd like to quickly cover a few housekeeping topics. So as we're being joined by people from across the country, you may experience a temporary glitch during the live stream. We thank you in advance for your patience. Today's webinar is being recorded. We will be sharing a link to the recording after the event, so keep an eye on your inboxes. We welcome you to revisit the content and share it with your colleagues, friends and family. We want you to join in on the conversation and share your thoughts with our online community. Feel free to connect with us through Facebook, Twitter and Instagram using hashtag NCC Nature Talks during and after the webinar. We also invite your comments and questions. You'll notice a Q&A chat box on your screen. If you think of a question for speakers at any point, just type it in there. Please include who the question is intended for, and we will answer them at the end of the webinar. At this time, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dan Kraus, Senior Conservation Biologist. 
Dan Kraus is an expert on Canadian biodiversity and has authored reports on topics ranging from freshwater key biodiversity areas to species at risk legislation. Most recently, he led an initiative to develop Canada's first list of nationally endemic plants and animals. The floor is all yours, Dan. Great, thank you, Sarah. I've been with the Nature Conservancy Canada now for over 18 years. Almost every day, I continue to be amazed by the impact of our work. Honestly, I've seen us complete projects that even as a devout conservation optimist, I once would have been, I once would have thought almost impossible. Today, I want to talk to you about the impact that we're having on conservation across Canada through your support of the Landmark Campaign. I'm going to share a lot of facts and figures about this impact. Now, these numbers are important. They help to show what we've done and they measure our progress. As a scientist, I love data and I know that the numbers I will share will fascinate and inspire you. But I'm seeing another impact of our work that I also want to share. It's an impact that's harder to measure and may even be immeasurable, but it may be the most important impact of all and the future of nature and people may depend on it. So first, the numbers. Thanks to you and 110,000 other donors, we raised more than $750 million and we invested those funds into 540 conservation projects from coast to coast to coast through the Landmark Campaign. These projects range in size from a few acres to our work in supporting the conservation of Canada's largest national marine conservation area. Overall, we help to expand Canada's network of protected areas by conserving an additional 115,000 square kilometers of Canada's lands and waters. Now, I want you to know that these aren't just any old 115,000 square kilometers of Canada. Even more important than how much we've protected, maybe what we protected. The Nature Conservancy of Canada uses the best available information to help us make conservation decisions. We balance the three pillars of conservation planning, biodiversity importance, urgency and opportunity to help us make sure we're investing in the right place places for the right reasons at the right time. As a result, the lands and waters we've protected through the landmark campaign are some of the most important places for nature in Canada. In some cases, if we hadn't have acted today, these places would have been lost to tomorrow. The lands and waters we protected provide habitat for 130 of Canada's most endangered species. Some of these species are threatened because although still widespread, they're rapidly declining like many prairie songbirds. But about half of the endangered species you help to protect are only found in small numbers and a few scattered locations. Protecting these habitats is critical for their conservation. In places like Oak Lake North in Manitoba, where your support allowed the Nature Conservancy of Canada to accept the gift of land from David Lacey in memory of his late wife, Susan. We are not only protecting threatened prairie habitats, but our staff also discovered this little butterfly called the Dakota Skipper. The Dakota Skipper is an endangered species in Canada and the US. Protecting this place is critical for preventing its extinction. The lands and waters we protected have also allowed us to secure and restore critically important corridors for wildlife. These corridors are essential to connect and protect habitat for animals that need lots of space. They include places such as the Frog Bear Corridor, which provides connectivity in BC's Creston Valley, the Frontenac Arc that connects Ontario's Algonquin Park with the Adirondacks in New York, and the Canuck property in Quebec that connects key protected areas in a region where natural habitats are becoming increasingly fragmented. What we achieve during the landmark campaign isn't just about conservation in Canada. Our efforts here at home benefit the world and are a critical component of global efforts to stop the decline of nature. The places we protected are helping to conserve 15 world biosphere reserves, including Southwest Nova, the Niagara Escarpment near where I live, and Mount Aerosmith in BC. We help to protect eight wetlands of international importance, including the Minasing wetlands and Columbia River wetlands, 
and 90 places that have been designated critical habitat for bird conservation, including migratory stopover sites of global importance, such as the Bay of Fundy, Pelee Island, and Douglas Marsh. Now, most people don't think of Canada when you mention globally threatened wildlife or habitats, but it's important for all Canadians to know that we have species and ecosystems in our own backyard that are as wondrous and as threatened as any on the planet. Your support has helped us to protect globally endangered ecosystems, such as tall grass prairie, rock barrens that we call alvars, and aspen parklands. We protected habitat for seven species that are endemic to Canada. They're found nowhere else in the world. Your support has helped us to conserve 10 Canadian species that from a global perspective are more threatened than the giant panda or African elephant, such as this handsome Blanding's turtle. Perhaps it is this recognition of Canada's important role in global biodiversity conservation that it was not just Canadians that supported the landmark campaign, but people from 40 other countries. Media attention for our projects came from the US, the UK and beyond. Together we are changing Canada and we are changing the world. Since the landmark campaign started eight years ago, there has been an increased recognition that the impacts of nature conservation go beyond just protecting endangered species and wildlife corridors. By protecting and restoring nature, we're also protecting and restoring the benefits that nature provides to people. Right now, the forests, grasslands and wetlands that you help to protect are pulling carbon from the atmosphere. They're holding back floodwaters, removing air pollution. Protecting and restoring natural habitats is a nature-based solution to reverse the degradation of our land, air, and water. Here's an example. Our new Buffalo Pound property, it not only protects intact prairie habitats that support uh, threatened species such as Sprague's Pippet or Bobolink, but it also helps to ensure the purity of drinking water for one quarter of Saskatchewan's population. Now we know the work that we've done has occurred within a rapidly changing world. Well, what we have achieved is monumental. Nature and the benefits that nature provides to people continue to be threatened by habitat loss, invasive species and climate change. But there has been an awakening. Governments, cities and corporations around the world are making new pledges to stop the loss of biodiversity and restabilize our climate. There is a greater recognition that connecting with nature is essential for our health and our well being, that nature is the foundation of our society, and that when nature thrives, we all thrive. A shift in our relationship with nature. This may be one of the most important impacts of our work. When we protect and restore nature, we are not just changing ecosystems and wildlife habitats, but we are gently nudging our human relationship with nature. Every day in the communities where our staff, volunteers, donors and supporters live and work, we are showcasing the benefits of protecting and restoring nature. The work we do provides evidence of hope, of a better Canada, of a better world for nature and for people. We can create a future where kids don't need to worry about climate change or flooding or drought. When nature is no longer assigned a value of zero on our ledger books, when wildlife populations and ecosystems are in a state of recovery. When across society, we recognize the value that nature brings to our lives and the importance of conservation. So I'm excited to introduce to you two of my colleagues who are on the front lines of protecting nature and shining a light down the path towards a better future. So first, Esme. Esme Batten is Program Manager for Midwestern Ontario. She's been with the Nature Conservancy of Canada for almost six years now, with most of her work in the Saugeen Bruce Peninsula, Manitoulin Island Archipelago, and Lower Maitland River Valley. Whenever you're ready, Esme. Great, thank you so much. So hi everyone, my name is Esme Batten. I work for the, in Midwestern Ontario as the program director. And I never would have thought I would have the opportunity to complete conservation at the scale we're able to here at NCC. 
as an optimist like Dan, I still find myself amazed by the conservation work we're able to achieve working together with communities, partners, and supporters like you all across Canada. I'm also really excited to share some of the great work my team and I have been completing over the past few years during the Landmark Campaign, and specifically to share the story of our work on Coburn Island in Midwestern Ontario, and another incredible opportunity we're working on right now on Manitoulin Island. So if you were like me when I joined NCC about six years ago, I had never heard of Coburn Island and certainly would not have been able to point it out on a map. However, Coburn Island really is a spectacular place and not only for the biodiversity and vast intact wilderness it supports, but also because of the community of people that call it home. Coburn Island is found just to the east of the US border on Lake Huron and is the seventh largest island in the Great Lakes at just over 17,000 hectares. It supports intact forest intermixed with coastal wetlands, Great Lakes beaches, sand dunes supporting globally rare species and stunning lakes and streams. NCC first had the opportunity to start protecting this amazing island in 2012. And since then, with the help of our supporters, we've been able to protect over 62% of the island, or 10,743 hectares. NCC lands on Coburn Island now represent one of the largest protected intact hardwood forests in southern Ontario, and it supports one of the largest populations of the at-risk pitcher thistle in Canada. Coburn Island really represents a unique opportunity to preserve the function of a large scale and diverse ecosystem while allowing natural processes to continue uninterrupted. Such an undertaking may be unimaginable again in 20 years. As with all our work across Canada's most important natural areas, protecting Coburn Island is just the beginning. Stewardship or managing the land for the long term is at the heart of what we do and what I spent my first years, five years at NCC focused on. Each and every property we protect is monitored and managed so that the ecosystems are maintained and species thrive, even if that means leaving it be. This can include activities like restoring wetlands, grasslands and forests, monitoring for species at risk, planting native species and building trails or installing signage. Our team of biologists has been busy monitoring these rare species and ecosystems across Coburn Island, plus the threats that face them, such as Canada's worst invasive species, Phragmites. I hinted at it before, but the community of people on Coburn Island is really unique. It's a mix of people from both Canada and the US, and they've all been drawn to Coburn Island for different reasons. However, we all share the same love for the island and want to see it protected for generations to enjoy as we do now. Towards this goal, NCC and Coburn Islanders work together to monitor rare species like Houghton's Goldenrod. Uh, it's on the dune system you can see behind the picture of Caitlin, our biologist, myself and Ellen. Uh, tackle invasive species like the large patch of invasive Phragmites we're sitting on in the picture and a new invader called giant knotweed. And we also monitor trails for new invasions as well. So our goals for Coburn Island are all the same. And it really has been a pleasure falling in love with both the island and the people that live there. We certainly look forward to continuing to steward Coburn Island for the future together while also looking for new opportunities. And as we look into the past at what we've been able to achieve for conservation here in this region of the Great Lakes, it's also really important we keep looking forward. As I mentioned before, I'm honestly always amazed at the conservation work we're able to complete at NCC, and I'm also excited to be a part of a team always pushing to do more. All of our work up until this point has led us to an incredible opportunity to purchase a massive 7,608 hectare property just east of Coburn Island on Manitoulin Island. The Vital Bay Forest and Shoreline property represents the landscape level approach to conservation that is so urgently needed right now. Before I get into the specifics of the Vital Bay project, I wanted to share some information about the scale of the conservation opportunity we have and how it expands on our work on Coburn Island during the Landmark campaign. So when combined with nearby and adjacent conservation lands that NCC has already conserved, this will become a protected area complex of 250 square kilometers or 24,860 hectares, the largest of its kind south of the Canadian Shield in Ontario. 
It will also conserve an astonishing 86 kilometers of Great Lake shoreline, more than twice what is currently protected at Bruce Peninsula National Park. Now, I know we can all appreciate that this is a massive opportunity to protect a lot of land, especially here in Southern Ontario, but it's hard to picture the impact and scale of it. So large connected wildlife blocks like those at Vital Bay and Coburn Island with their internal corridors and connections intact are critical for sustaining wild re wide ranging species, sorry, like black bear and gray wolves. These corridors also provide habitat for seasonal migration and reduce the possibility of genetic isolation within populations. Large intact systems also provide essential means for species to adapt to climate change, pr providing continuous habitat across large areas, allowing species to shift ranges northwards or otherwise, still allowing for nature's processes to continue uninterrupted. In addition to providing habitat for diversity of both rare and common species, the intact forests and wetlands at both Vital Bay and Coburn Island filter our water while protecting the network of extensive but fragile underwater karst waterways. This water then flows into Lake Huron, include, um, and high quality water is essential for spawning and foraging habitat for many species, including lake whitefish and lake sturgeon. So these benefits are not only positive for neighboring landowners, but also for those across Manitoulin and Lake Huron. So now that we've discussed some of the broader benefits of conservation at this scale, I'm really excited to talk about the fantastic opportunity we have to protect the Vital Bay Forest and Shoreline property. So this 7,608 hectare property features coastal cliffs along the Niagara Escarpment, over 18 kilometers of undeveloped Lake Huron shoreline, pristine inland lakes and wetlands, and intact forests and alvars. I have had the pleasure of visiting the property last year, uh, and it's almost impossible to describe how truly incredible this opportunity is. So Manitoulin Island is the largest freshwater island in the world and has always been a priority for conservation, but the island faces ever-growing threats to its natural spaces. Much as I've experienced living here on the Saugeen Bruce Peninsula, the quiet beaches, soaring cliffs, and clear turquoise water bring more people to visit the island each year. Ever-growing development pressures for cottages and second homes pose a significant threat. And like most of the Great Lakes shoreline, the opportunities for conservation have become few and far between. The property's alvars, forests, wetlands, and grasslands provide essential ecosystem services to the region. This includes carbon storage, removal of air pollution, and floodwater storage. While the carbon sequestration and storage benefits of the property are important in our collective efforts to reduce greenhouse gas levels in the atmosphere, this property is particular criti particularly critical for water quality and quantity and the protection of intact shoreline. So this property provides an excellent example of the scale at which we need to work in order to combat climate change. In addition to its biological significance, it also holds importance to the local communities that have cared about this landscape for generations. If successful in protecting the property, we're excited to work together as we have on Coburn Island with local communities and the seven First Nations to learn how we can best steward this landscape forever from those who have always cared for this place. We share a mutual vision for our children and our grandchildren to experience true wilderness here in Southern Ontario. So even though we may be celebrating the conclusion of one campaign, the reality is that our work continues and the urgency of our mission grows every day. NCC must raise $16 million to secure and steward this vast coastal wilderness for the future, and we're currently about 70% of the way towards our goal. There may never be another opportunity to set aside such a large tract of ecologically significant land in Southern Ontario. So if you would like to be a part of this historic project, please reach out to me to learn more. I would love to connect with you. And I truly cannot wait to see what more we can achieve for nature in the years to come. Thanks, Ed, Esme, that's uh, that's incredible. I'm really hoping I can get out in the field with you uh, this summer to, to explore this property. I mean, 86 kilometers of Great Lakes shoreline and protecting one of the largest complexes of intact forests south of the Canadian Shield. I mean, this really is a project that is going to have an impact that will ripple through into future, future generations. Uh, great, great work. 
Uh, next speaker, I'm uh, going to kind of move across the country. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to Delaney Schlenko. Uh, Delaney's current position is with, is managing the Cooking Lake Moraine Natural Area and Beaver Hills Biosphere Reserve. Uh, she's worked with the Nature Conservancy of Canada for nearly two years now. First as the Acting Natural Area Manager for Central Alberta and then moving a little further north to be the Natural Area Manager for Northeast Alberta. Delaney graduated from the University of Alberta with a bachelor's degree of science in environmental and conservation sciences. Off to you, Delaney. Awesome. Hi, everybody. My name is Delaney Schlumpko, and I'll be talking to you today about the successes of the Keep the Beaver Hills Wild campaign, which is part of this landmark campaign. But first, where is the Beaver Hills located? It is located east of the city of Edmonton in the province of Alberta, and the Nature Conservancy of Canada has been working in this area since 2002. We also refer to it as the Cooking Lake Marine Natural Area. This landscape is very unique as it was formed by receding glaciers, creating a rich mosaic of wetlands, lakes, forests, and some grasslands. It is also 100 to 200 meters higher in elevation in comparison to the surrounding area. In addition, the soil is not very productive, making it undesirable for farming. In 2016, the area was recognized by the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization as a biosphere. The NCC actively works with the Beaver Hills Biosphere Reserve Association, along with many other partners in the area. Within the biosphere, there are many areas conserved by multiple parties, including the Elk Island National Park, Cooking Lake uh, Blackfoot Provincial Recreation Area, as well as other conservation sites owned and managed by other private land trusts like the NCC. The area is a very important wildlife corridor and the NCC's conservation work assists with expanding conserved areas, leading to safer passage for wildlife. Elk, black bear, moose, mule deer, American badgers and coyotes are just some examples of the mammals who use this corridor. In addition, you can also find trumpeter swans, eared grebes, great blue herons, fishers, and Canadian toad in the area as well. So let's dive into the impact of your support. Your support and contribution to conserving and stewarding wild spaces is helping keep the Beaver Hills wild. But how have we began expanding conserved areas in the Beaver Hills? Within the last year, we have conserved an additional 316 acres through the securement of three new properties. First is the Stone Lake property, which is 156 acres located directly west of Elk Island National Park. Next is the Ballberg property, which is 80 acres bordering the Monistic Game Bird Sanctuary and directly west of two of our other conservation sites. Lastly, it's the Illerburn property, which is another 80 acres located on Gambling Lake in close proximity to other uh, of our other projects located on the same lake. I'll now speak to you about a couple stewardship projects in the area. I could talk to you all day about the exciting stewardship projects I get to do in the Beaver Hills, but we only have limited time. So I'll like to touch on a couple of my favorites, starting with beaver coexistence management. As the Beaver Hills name implies, there are a lot of beavers in the area because of the perfect habitat the landscape provides for them. That being said, sometimes beavers can cause undesirable impacts to a landowner's property, such as flooding hay fields, cutting down trees a landowner may want, or threatening the structural integrity of structures like culverts, for example. However, there are tools you can use to coexist with our big tailed neighbors. We have two ongoing beaver coexistence projects in the natural area, but the most recent project was on the Gambling Lake Cary Conservation Area. The beavers were damming up a culvert that runs underneath a township road, causing undesirable flooding on neighboring properties and threatening the culvert's structural integrity. So we worked with Beaver County, the local municipality here, to mitigate the issue by installing an exclusion fence and pond leveler extending from this culvert. Um, but what does an exclusion fence do? It does exactly what the name implies. It's, it's basically a fence that excludes beavers from the culvert. It is built at awkward angles to make the beavers work harder to dam against. And 
But how does that water still flow through if the beavers are successful at damming against it? Well, this is where the pond leveler comes in. It is a 40-foot poly pipe extending from the fence. It allows water to still flow through the fence despite the debris around it. There's also a small cage on the open end of that pipe to make sure the beavers don't try any funny business because they are very smart critters. <laughs> um, the finished product is in the photo to the right on the slide. So far, everything is holding up, but I have to continue monitoring it and checking in and making adjust adjustments as needed as again. Beavers are very smart and they're known as ecosystem engineers. So we also work with many partners in the area and have a handful of partner-owned projects like the Golden Ranches property located on the eastern shores of Cooking Lake. The partners involved with this large property include the NCC, Alberta Conservation Association, Alberta Fish and Game Association, Edmonton and Area Land Trust, Ducks Unlimited Canada, Strathcona County, and the Beaver Hills Biosphere Reserve Association. We recently had another nonprofit, Project Forest, approach us with an exciting restoration project to rewild the Area 5 quarter section on this large property. The Area 5 quarter section has been cultivated for many years. When the NCC, ACA, and AFG acquired this quarter of Golden Ranches, we had the goal to one day restore it. We just needed the time to create a restoration plan, the funds to complete this ambitious 55 hectare project, and a restoration expert also recommended that we actively cultivated the field until we were ready to restore it to help maintain the soil condition and help maintain any uh, weed problems that may arise. However, when Project Forest approached us this past fall to partner on this restoration project, it was immediate yes. Project Forest rewilds Alberta to bring back forests through restoration, and they're funded through local businesses using a tiered membership funding approach. They'll complete the site preparation, the planting, and the site maintenance. They created the planting plan this past fall, and we are set to be begin planting this spring, and we could not be more excited to kick off the project. Now, to close everything off, the four broad goals of the Keep the Beaver Hills Wild campaign is to expand conserved areas, which leads to safer passage for, lot, for wildlife, nurturing nature, which is essentially stewardship, and conduct further research. We are en route to achieve these goals, and we thank you for your continued support. But we are not done yet, and we do still have some work to do. We need to continue expanding these areas conserved within the important wildlife quarter. Uh, we also need to continue to partner with others to conduct further research and raise more funds to implement stewardship projects, whether that is as big as a restoration project or is as small as a beaver coexistence project. Thank you for your time today. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And thanks, I'll hand it off to Dan. Great, thanks Delaney, that, that's great work. You know, I just recently learned that the Aspen Parklands where you work are one of the few eco-regions in Southern Canada that almost completely only occur within Canada. So really the, the conservation of it is, is up to you and, and all of us. Uh, and we're really looking forward to hearing more progress about the, uh, the Keep the Beaver Hills Wild campaign. You know, listening to you guys, I, I get really excited about conservation and actually I've never been more excited or optimistic about conservation than I am right now. Canada and 50 other countries, including Mexico and now the US, have pledged to protect more than 30% of their lands and oceans by 2030. In Canada, this means more than doubling the amount of protected and conserved areas we currently have, or adding the equivalent of over 260 new Banff National Parks. We're also at the dawning of the United Nations Decade for Ecosystem Restoration, a decade where in Canada and around the world, we have the opportunity not just to slow the loss of nature, but to turn it around. You know, we need to do more projects like the ones we just heard about from Esme and Delaney, where we're not just protecting scattered fragments of a world that was, but envisioning and creating a world that can be. We can build healthier, more resilient ecosystems for the future. We can restore and protect wetlands, forests and grasslands and the places where people and nature need them the most. We can reconnect our protected areas with a national network of wildlife corridors. We can empower and inspire local efforts to protect nature and support indigenous led conservation. 
and we can recover our most endangered plants and animals and save them from extinction. We can leave these places in better shape for the next generations. So many of the solutions are ready. We have a lot of work to do, and I hope that you will continue to join us. Sarah, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Dan. Uh, we have several questions for the speakers that have been submitted by the audience. And um, as a reminder, if you have a question that you have not yet submitted, please enter it using the Q&A chat box feature and let us know who the question is for and we'll get through as many questions as time allows. So I'm just going to go to the questions over here. If you'll bear with me for one moment. Um, OK, so here's a question. How many acres in Canada are lost to development every year? It's 6,000 in the US, but I need Canadian information for my soon to be published book. So I will hand that off to any one of our panelists. I can I can start that off. Um, it, it's variable. I, I, I can't give you a specific number right now, but we do know the places in Canada where nature is disappearing the uh, the quickest. Uh, Aspen Parklands, uh, where Delaney works, is certainly one of those places. The, the rate of, of deforestation, at least up until recently in that area, had been faster than what was happening in the Amazon rainforest. Uh, where Esme works in southern Ontario, this is one of the places where we have the highest number of species at risk. Uh, but much of the much of the area has been has been lost to development. That's why places like Vital Bay are just such a unique and, and special special opportunity. Um, there is information coming out, and I'll just let you know if you keep your eye on the Nature Conservancy of Canada website, we are going to be sharing some information about habitat loss and protection in eco regions across southern Canada, which will hopefully help you with your book, which I'd probably love to read. Thanks, Dan, and thanks, Carol, for your question. Uh, next question from Jillian. In Ontario, we are facing many challenges as to loss of important wetlands and green spaces. How can we convince governments of their value and importance? That's a great question, Jillian. And I'll leave it once again to our panelists to decide who, uh, who's going to jump in. OK, I'll, I'll jump in, but I'm going to pass it to Esme at, at some point. Um, I, I think some of the, the, the slides I was showing about valuing nature for the benefits it provides to people are, are one of the ways that we need to talk about our work a little more broadly. Uh, you know, certainly for Esme Delaney, myself and probably many of you, I mean, we love nature and just protecting nature for nature's sake is, is reason enough and we, we need more people to love nature. But we can also talk about nature through the lens of the benefits that nature provides. And we know in terms of climate stability, water, uh, and more and more about health and well-being and that importance of the human connection to nature, that can resonate with a broader audience. So part of it is just talking about our work in a, in a different way. Yeah, and I think that, uh, thanks Dan, just to add to that too, I think in Ontario especially, uh, more and more we're seeing people being interested to want to get out in nature, especially as we go through this global pandemic. I currently live on the Saugeen Peninsula where it's a tourist hotspot and it's great to see so many people getting out and enjoying nature more. And I think that that's being recognized by everyone across the country. And I think that it's also really important that we also recognize the way that we sometimes communicate our love for nature isn't always the same. As Dan mentioned, my love for snakes and turtles might not be shared by everyone, but we all do enjoy it for different reasons. And it's just a way of finding a way to communicate commonly about our love for nature, even if it doesn't always sound or look the same as we would expect. So I certainly find that everyone that lives here on Manitoulin Island loves the natural spaces that we have and want to see them protected. And I think just Kind of focusing on that commonality too is always a great way. Thanks Esme and Dan and uh, Esme uh, this question is for you from Julia. Um, she would like to ask a question regarding Phragmites as they're becoming my focus of study in university and has been uh, and there's been discovery of frags on Manitoulin that will need to be dealt with once you have the land under NCC's protection. 
That's a great question. Unfortunately, Phragmites has made its way to Manitoulin Island, uh, but we've already been doing some great work, especially with um, the Phragmites Working Group on Manitoulin run by Judith Jones. So NCC has been participating in control of Phragmites across Ontario and Canada for years now. And on Manitoulin, it certainly is a focus of uh, many of our efforts, including many of my own uh, hours of work, removing it. Uh, and we have mapped some populations of Phragmites on Vital Bay already. Uh, so we'll certainly continue to kind of get a better understanding of where they are. And through our management planning process, um, kind of inventorying where the rare species are and where invasive species are, uh, like Phragmites, we'll be able to find the best way forward to kind of tackle those and work with the local communities as well to do that. Great, thank you, Esme. Uh, this next one is for Dan from Deb. Um, she lives in St. Catharines and uh, is able to help with government advocacy and other ways to volunteer. Planting, helping place natural logs for bees, beehives. Uh, and besides donating, then how can I help? Well, you, she mentioned a, a few great things that you can do there. So uh, one thing is that we do have a volunteer program at Nature Conservancy of Canada called our Conservation Volunteer Program. And that's a great way to get out, see some of our properties, help out with some of the stewardship actions that are needed, including things like removing perhaps Phragmites uh, and other, other invasive plants. Um, and also just amazing to get out with other people that, that hopefully share your passion with, with nature. Um, there's also things we can do around our, our backyards as well. And certainly during the pandemic, as people have been less able to get out, we're encouraging people to think of their backyards and the places around them as, as a nature reserve, you know, and, and try to discover those things that they can do to try to bring nature closer to home. And that can include things like creating habitat for bees or, or other species. Uh, and we do have a, a program called Small Acts for Conservation that just tries to list some of these things that we can all do to increase the richness of, of, of nature around us. Thank you, Dan. And I think this next one will be for Esme. Uh, will Vital Bay be accessible to the public and how do you balance the needs of species with the needs of people? Yeah, that's a great question. And as I mentioned before, when we first acquire property, we go through kind of a baseline inventory and property management planning process. So that kind of helps our team of biologists and other folks that are involved in the project get out onto the property to see where the rare species are and rare ecosystems, where the threats are such as invasive species, and then kind of create a big kind of to-do list or actions of what we need to do to mitigate, mitigate those threats and protect what we're kind of trying to protect. And as part of that, we also then look at uh, where our properties are must, might be best for a trail so that folks can get out and enjoy um, that area without negatively impacting those rare species or ecosystems we are working to protect. So we certainly think that Vital Bay will be accessible to the public and much like our lands across the country. And we're really excited to go through that management planning process if we are successful in securing the property. Thanks, Esme. Um, next question is, uh, what are some of the challenges with managing large remote properties like the one on Coburn Island? So I guess we'll start with Esme and then maybe if we could go to Delaney uh, for some input over there. Yeah, so uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, working on Coburn Island for about five years now and I'm excitedly already planning our next trip uh, for some stewardship work this summer. And it certainly is tricky having our staff located in different areas of the province um, to get out to these areas, but really the best opportunity is, is to work with the local community that's already doing a great job stewarding those lands. So we often work with a team of dedicated volunteers who include biologists as well as folks that are really experienced with invasive removal uh, to kind of all work together to manage this landscape for the future. Delaney? Uh, yeah, so because uh, the Cooking Lake Moraine slash Beaver Hills area is located directly east of Edmonton, I'm very lucky with the fact that it's pretty easy to access all these properties. Um, they're probably like half an hour away from where I am in Edmonton, so I, I, it's, I don't have to, I guess, face that challenge as much as Esme probably has to do with uh, Cockburn Island. So, yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, our next um, question, well, it's not really a question, well, it sort of is. <laughs> Gwyneth is asking the, for contact info for each of the speakers. Um, so I think I'll just jump in and say it's the first uh, dot last name of each of the speakers. 
at natureconservancy.ca if you'd like to reach them directly to ask any questions. Um, so we'll go next to a question from Ian. Uh, first of all, congratulations on your efforts and achievements. Uh, how is NCC working to leverage more funds or new money beyond existing commitments and programs from the federal government? Um, Delaney, would you want to respond to that? Then maybe over to Dan. Uh, yeah, maybe Dan is a better option. <laughs> I'm more stewardship. <laughs> I, I can I can start it off. Um, we're fortunate right now to have a, a great partnership with the federal government, a continu continuation of a partnership we've had for a while called the Natural Areas Conservation Program. Uh, so donations that we receive from the public can actually be matched through that those federal funds. Um, in addition, we do have partnerships with provincial governments, with corporations, but we certainly rely on the donations of, of individuals. In terms of leveraging more, I'm going to go back to that discussion about the benefits that nature provides to people. And especially with a rapidly changing climate, we're seeing more and more interest in what are often being called nature-based solutions. So not looking to traditional sort of cement and drains to solve some of the problems that we have with, with water, for example, but looking to nature to help us solve those, those problems. And so I think we're going to see more funding available to do things like conserving and protecting wetlands, replanting trees, and these are great for biodiversity, uh, but that funding will come because of those important benefits that, that nature provides to us. Fantastic, thanks, Dan. Um, so the next question is from Carol. What percentage of Canadian land is developed and how much is natural uh, slash wild? I wonder if um, one of you would have uh, a sense of scale over there. I can I can start that one off, and and so the question the the answer is there's a lot of Canada that's wild, right? But and actually Canada is one of of five countries that still contains wilderness areas, and we may be the only country that can actually protect those in the long term. But most of those areas in our far or in the far north, and those are very different ecosystems than the ones that Esme and Delaney are protecting. Most Canadians live in southern Canada, and that's where we've we've lost a lot of our natural cover. And there are places in southern Ontario that have less forest cover than developing nations like Madagascar or, or Haiti. So our our challenge as Canadians, and this is kind of unique, is that how do we protect some of the planet its last wilderness in our north, but at the same time, how can we protect and restore nature in southern Canada, where we have very high biodiversity, where most of our endangered species are, and where most people live and, and need those benefits from, from nature. So the numbers are, are variable in terms of how much how much we've uh, we've lost. We still have a lot in northern Canada, but we need to we need to really uh, work to protect and restore habitats in southern Canada. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so we have time for one more question. Um, do you have any advice for young environmental professionals who are st struggling to find work? So I'm very happy to see that people are thinking about uh, Canada's uh, environmental protection long term. So I'll leave that to uh, Delaney or Esme if you might have some uh, some insight. Uh, yeah, I can start off uh, being someone who just graduated university a couple years ago. Um, definitely take advantage of any volunteer opportunities that you can, like, for example, with the Nature Conservancy of Canada through a conservation volunteer program. I mean, right now it's pretty difficult with the pandemic, just in terms of like uh, sometimes our logistics with the volunteers. But feel free to reach out because even if you can volunteer with a stewardship person like myself on the ground, even just one on one volunteering is super helpful for me. And then also it's a very valuable experience for you as well. Uh, and just don't give up. Keep applying to every job that you see and put yourself out there. Sometimes it's really hard. Like I think I've when I was a student, I applied to probably like 30 plus jobs and then I finally landed one. So just don't give up and keep being persistent. And uh, yeah, that's what I'll tell you for my advice. At least I don't know if Esme has anything to add. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, that's great. And I would say I we've started working in Ontario with a great new program called the Canadian Conservation Corp, which really provides a great opportunity to kind of get a hands on experience of conservation work across Canada. So that's a, a placement program um, where you're working with conservation organizations at a variety of levels. And that's a really good way to kind of get an idea of what type of conservation you're most interested in uh, so that you can really focus on your path of your career. Sarah, I'll, I'll just add to that. You know, I often find when I'm talking to young people, they're, they're very polite and you know, we'll ask questions about conservation planning, but I can see what they really want to know is like, how did you get that cool job? Uh, so a few years ago, we actually wrote a blog. We talked to a bunch of uh, different people across the organization that hire young people and said, what are you looking for in terms of hiring new staff? So if you just Google, I think it's called like 10 tips to get a job in conservation or go to our website and look at our blog site called Landlines, you can find you can find some of those tips. But I'm envious because, as I said, it's such an amazing time to start getting involved in conservation um, that the, there's going to be lots of opportunities, I think. That's great. Thank you. Um, so that is all the time we have for questions today. Uh, if we didn't get to your question or you have something else you would like to ask any of our panelists, you can please reach out to us at events at natureconservancy.ca and we'll gladly pass those along to our panelists. So thank you to everyone who joined us today for today's webinar. Dan, Esme and Delaney, thank you for uh, sharing your insights and your expertise. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the impact of the Landmark Campaign, visit uh, nccnaturescapes.ca and stay tuned for the link to today's webinar recording. You'll receive that in a follow-up email within the next 24 hours. So we leave you today with a special video to say thank you for your support. Nature doesn't have the words to thank you, but we sure do.